Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, my name is Fabien Potentier. Um, only French people can pronounce it uh, the right way. Anyway, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Symfony, about the problems it tries to solve, um, and why I think that Laravel uh, took the right decision when, at some point, Taylor decided to use some of uh, our work. Um, so first, I want to answer one question, what is Symfony, and where does it come from? Um, it's a bit like Taylor, uh, I'm not a PHP guy, uh, I was doing a lot of Perl stuff, um, and actually I ate PHP. Um, but at some point, you know, PHP 5.0 came along, uh, it was about to be released, and for the very first time in my life, I was excited about PHP. Tiny. Um, so I decided to give it a try, and, and so I started to look around for uh, a good PHP 5 framework, and of course at that time there were none, um, but um, there were some nice libraries, uh, mainly uh, a nice MVC implementation, and, uh, which was quite robust, and uh, an active record li library. So, I decided to create uh, the glue between all those libraries, and eventually that became Symfony uh, version one. Um, and I, I did naturally um, started to work with PHP because, you know, just for the sake of it, but because I had some customers uh, who wanted to use PHP for um, their project. So I kind of, it was kind of required for me to uh, learn some PHP. And uh, a long time um, after that, about six years ago, um, I decided to start from scratch, right? Because Symfony 1 was really just the glue between some existing components. So at some point, we hit the limit of what was possible with the architecture. So I decided to start from scratch. Also because the web evolved a lot. Um, and, and, and PHP itself uh, also evolved a lot. And of course, during the first few years of Symfony 1, I learned uh, a lot of lessons and I, I got a lot of feedback from the community. So I wanted to st start over and, and do something, uh, something else. And that became Symfony 2. So Symfony version 2 is a set of 25 plus uh, PHP components. And each component solves a common uh, development problem. And it tries to solve each problem independently of the other ones. Um, so that you can use one uh, component without having to install all the other ones. And each component tries to give you all the common features that you need out of the box. And tries to be uh, flexible and extensible so that you can add your own stuff if you uh, need to. It's also interesting to understand that those components um, borrow ideas and concepts and, and best practices um, from and design patterns from other languages like Perl, um, Python, Ruby, even Java, um, and other frameworks like Django in, in the Python world and, and Spring. Um, and notice that I don't mention Rails because there is no Rails inspiration in Symfony version 2. So here is a list, a uh, full list of what we have um, today in Symfony 2. Um, so a lot of different packages, components, um, and as you can see, um, a lot of those are really about um, uh, providing solution for low-level stuff, like the console, process, debug, uh, the finder, CSS selector, YAML, um, boring stuff, really. And you don't want to reinvent the wheel on these ones. Um, uh, and as you can see also, it's not about, Symfony is really about the low level stuff, the building blocks that you need to create a project. It's not about uh, abstracting the, the business logic. The business logic is really what you need to implement. Um, okay, so we have some tools. Um, I listed a few of them here. Uh, those are very specialized uh, libraries um, and most of the time they only do one thing they, and, and they try to do it well. And getting started with them is really easy, especially with Composer. Just add a dependency in your uh, Composer.json file and you can 
use them uh, right away. So here are a few examples. This is the finder component. So the finder component is about uh, finding files and directories um, with uh, a fluent interface. So here I'm creating a new finder and I want uh, to get all the files in the current directory. And then you get back, um, it's not an array of files, it's an iterator that you can iterate on uh, and you get some SPL file info instances and then you can do whatever you want with uh, the files. Um, of course, you can look for files in more than one directory. We can, uh, we accept uh, glob um, directories, globs for um, directories, you can exclude some directories and uh, the finder is not limited to the file system which means that you can search for files on um, FTP servers or Amazon S3 or whatever. And then when you get the results then you can filter them. You can filter by date, name, uh, file content and you can even give an anonymous function to uh, implement your own logic. Uh, CSS selector is quite interesting. Um, it, it is all about converting CSS selectors to their XPath equivalent. And again, one task, uh, only one entry point, the two XPath method, and, and that's all. Um, I think I have another example where I, I um, use some CSS selectors. So this is mainly useful when you are doing some functional testing. Um, debug. Again, it does only one thing. There is one uh, method in uh, one public method, debug enable. Um, it registers an error handler and an exception handler to give you um, better looking error messages and more useful information than the default um, when, of course, when something bad happens in your code. So this is an example of uh, an exception. So as you can see, there, there is an exception, then you have the stack trace so you can get all the information you need to debug uh, the problem. And sometimes we uh, try to be smarter than PHP and give you more uh, information about the problem. So here I created a finder instance, but I forgot to add the use statement uh, before. So it says attempted to load class finder from the global namespace because there is no namespace um, in this file. And it tells you that you probably forgot uh, to add a use statement um, before and it gives you the use statement. So actually the finder uh, is found in the Symfony component finder finder. Um, so it, we have a lot of uh, stuff like that in Symfony. We try to um, is debugging stuff and, and we try to give um, solution for uh, common errors. ENTL. Uh, I don't even have an example of uh, ENTL because uh, you just add ENTL as a dependency in, uh, in your composer.json file and then it does everything for you. So um, it is going to uh, enable um, a PHP replacement for uh, the C, uh, the C extension, the, the ENTL C extension if um, it is not enabled in your PHP uh, version. Quite interesting. And it does a bit more than just that because it also adds a bunch of methods to access the localization data, data of the ICU library. So you can get access to the language names, the country names, the currencies, and, and, and a bit more. So that's about the tools. Uh, we have more of them, but I think you understand what's the goal uh, of those tools are uh, with those examples. We also have... Um, what, what I like to call frameworks. So those are a bit more complex. Uh, they give you more power. Uh, they are, their integration is a bit more involving than the tools. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about some of them uh, later on. I'm not going to talk about the console because I think that Taylor is going to talk about it uh, tomorrow. So that's the Symfony components and there are the more important assets of the Symfony project. But the Symfony project is not just about the components. It's also about uh, a full stack framework named also Symfony. And the Symfony full stack framework is based on those components. A bit like Laravel. And Laravel can be seen as another implementation of a web framework on top of the Symfony components. Uh, yeah, that's kind of important also. So obviously Symfony is an uh, open source project and we are using a very permissive license, MIT, which means that uh, you can integrate and you can use the Symfony components in any project. 
um, even the GPL ones. Um, as a conclusion uh, for this part of the talk, um, here is my definition for Symfony. For me, Symfony is a middleware, a PHP middleware for uh, PHP applications. Um, this is an object-oriented one. Um, what does it mean? Um, I think that's um, the key point here. Um, PHP, out of the box, gives you all the tools you need to build web application. But um, everything is, nothing is object-oriented, right? So the core of PHP is made of functions and global variables. Um, and if you have a closer look, um, because you know PHP have, has some um, built-in classes, but none of them are uh, related to the web, right? Which is a bit weird because PHP is really a web language. So one of the main goals of Symfony uh, is to give the developer a nice object-oriented API on top of PHP for everything that is related to the web. Let me talk about one example. Um, obviously, as we are talking about the web, we are talking about HTTP, and as web developers, we are dealing with HTTP um, every single day. And uh, the HTTP Foundation component is all about um, HTTP and, 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 and trying to leverage uh, the HTTP uh, protocol as much as possible. So this is a typical um, HTTP request. So this is the HTTP request message. Um, pretty easy to understand. I want to get the full resource. Uh, I'm going to use the uh, uh, HTTP 1.1 protocol version, and there is one header, which is the host example.com. How do you represent this HTTP message in PHP? Like this. So, when you are using plain PHP, you are going to use functions to start a session, for instance, and global variables dollar underscore get to get the query string stuff, underscore post, file, cookie, session, server, whatever. So it's all about uh, global variables. Um, and this is a very low level abstraction on top of the HTTP message. This is how you can get the, the client remote address. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that does not really work if you, are, if you want to be sure to have the real IP address of the client, right? If you want to get the real one, you need to do something like this, right? And please don't use that because it's not even secure, right? Uh, because you need to take care of uh, reverse, reverse proxies, all the proxies actually that you can have between uh, the client and the server, and you need to trust and you need to know which proxies you can trust. So basically, you can trust the reverse proxies that you manage. You can't trust the other proxies. So you need a way to configure which proxies you trust. Um, and of course, we are talking about security issues here. right? If you don't get this right, you will have some security issues. So it's kind of important to have a solid implementation of this, this kind of stuff. And PHP does not, by default. So the problems with PHP, core PHP, first, it's not object-oriented. And this is really a shame, right? I'm not going to um, explain why, uh, but I think you had, um, we, we had to talk about um, unit testing, for instance, and I think that's one of the reasons. But there are other ones. Uh, the fact that PHP is using um, global variables means that the request is a singleton. And perhaps it's just me, but I don't like singletons. And I'm, as a matter of fact, we don't have a single singleton in, in Symfony version 2. Not a single one. I think it, it is a smell, really. If you have a singleton, you have a problem. <laughs> um, so, and why? So, it acts as a singleton because you have those global variables, dollar underscore get. You can only have one underscore get variable, of course, or post or whatever. It means that you can only work with one request per PHP process, which is not really a problem when talking with a client because you are going to 
um, deliver one response for one request. But if you want to simulate a request for testing, then it's a bit odd. You can override the underscore get or underscore post global variable, but if you try to override uh, the stuff in underscore server, that's a nightmare, really. Um, as I said before, it's only a very low-level abstraction on top of the HTTP message, so it's not um, always... Um, uh, you need more than just this uh, low-level abstraction, and it's not object-oriented. Okay, so in Symfony, the HTTP request message uh, is um, a class, and you can create a request from the global variables. This is the first example. Or you can create any request that you want. Uh, the first argument is the path of uh, the request, then you have the method, and you have a bunch of other arguments so that you can tweak the request like you want. Uh, which means that you can have more than one request in, in a process, and you can also uh, override the global variables uh, from a request if you want to be compatible with um, an existing library that doesn't use a request object. Okay, and of course you can see that uh, the request class exposes a bunch of method uh, you can use to access the various aspects of a request, uh, the session, the path info, the client IP. This one is um, how you can get the client IP address in a safe way. Uh, this is how you can set the, the, the proxies that you actually trust. Uh, so it's not, um, uh, it's, it's really um, simpler uh, because you know that just by calling this method you're, you're going to have the right IP address. If we have a look at the response, um, the response HTTP message, this is the exact same story. Right. This is uh, a typical HTTP uh, message for the response. Uh, we have the protocol, we have the status code, uh, we have a bunch of headers, and then the body of the response. Right. And in PHP, again, uh, you deal with the response thanks to uh, functions, header, set cookie, and global variables for the session, for instance. And then if you want to um, construct um, the response body, then you can just use echo or print. So you output stuff directly to the user. So, like for the request, um, the way PHP works assume that you will only ever deal with one response in a PHP process, which is fine when you are talking with a real client, but if you want to simulate a, res a request response uh, round trip, if you want to simulate um, um, uh, a client doing several stuff in the same PHP process, you are out of luck, right? So that, that makes testing more difficult again. That's also a lot of our abstraction. Um, for instance, um, it doesn't work on the command line because PHP, when you are on the command line, PHP thinks that you are not going to talk with an HTTP client, so it behaves in a totally different way. So, for instance, the cache control header, which is set automatically by PHP when you are in a web context, is not set when you are on the command line interface, so the, the behavior is totally different. Um, if you have a look, if you want to get all the headers that you set, uh, there is uh, um, a function called headers underscore list, and it always returns an empty array on the command line interface. Right? And if you want to get the status code that you set, it's just impossible. I mean, it's possible as of PHP 5.4. So, that's a problem, of course. So, it does not play well with the CLI, and of course, it's not object-oriented. And again, in Symfony, um, we have a response object. You can create a response object. The first argument is the content, the body of the response. The second one is the status code. And then you can pass an array of uh, headers. Um, and at some point, you send the response back to the client. But if you don't call this response uh, send method, then you can just manipulate and introspect the response the way you want. Um, and of course, you only uh, want to uh, run uh, to uh, call send one um, to return one response to the client. 
One thing that PHP does out of the box is the fact that it, it can stream the response back to the client, right? Because as soon as you echo something to the client, the headers are flushed and then you can stream uh, the response uh, content to the, to the client. We can do the same with Symfony with the stream response class that takes an anonymous function and then you can do whatever you want to stream the response back to uh, the client. Okay, last but not the least, um, so the request and the response object are totally independent in Symfony, but if you have a look at uh, the HTTP specification, uh, the response can behave uh, differently based on some request headers, for instance. So if um, if you call, uh, if you want to not get a resource but just want the head of a request, then the body should be empty, right? And this is what the prepare method does. So based on the request information, uh, the prepare method is going to tweak the response accordingly. So for instance, if the uh, uh, request is a add HTTP method, that then it's going to remove uh, the body of, of the response. That's a very simple example, but we have a bunch of uh, stuff uh, going on in, in this method. So that the goal of um, the Symfony HTTP Foundation is to be um, HTTP compliant. So we want to be um, close to the HTTP specification as much as possible. Um, so, the Symfony HTTP Foundation component is um, a fully featured and object-oriented abstraction on top of the HTTP messages. And, and, and the, the thing is, it tries to replace um, the PHP native global variables and functions, and it allows you to write better and more testable and more secure code. So, that's one aspect of Symfony. We try to implement best practices, standards like HTTP uh, or dependency injection. We are not going to talk about dependency injection today. Um, and we also try to innovate uh, in the PHP world. Uh, the first thing that we did, it's just uh, a couple of examples here. Uh, seven years ago, um, we are the first to uh, propose a, a web debug toolbar. Uh, it was in Symfony version one. This one uh, comes from uh, Symfony version two. And if you have a look around, nowadays all the major frameworks, uh, be they in, in, in Python, Ruby, or, or PHP, have a, a similar tool. And um, as of Symfony version two, we go one step further uh, with the web profiler, uh, which gives you a bunch of information and insights about how your application behaves. So this one is a timeline where you can see uh, how much time is spent in different section of um, uh, the handling of a request. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is Twig, uh, which is what I call a, a, a real templating system for PHP. Uh, and we were the first major PHP framework to not use PHP as a templating system. And of course, a lot of people uh, still think that PHP is a templating system. It is, but it is a very bad one. And actually, if you have a look at the evolution of PHP in the last five years, it did not evolve as a PHP templating system, right? Adding namespaces, anonymous function, all the stuff that were added to PHP, it was for the language, not for the templating system. So, just try Twig if you have not, uh, and you won't look back, really. And nowadays, so many projects actually use Twig uh, or, or have switched to Twig. Uh, so, this is just some of them. So, we have big projects like uh, Drupal or PHPBB or Magento version 2 is going to use uh, Twig also. Uh, we have CMSs, frameworks, e-commerce platform, and a bunch more. Okay. Actually, I'm going to talk about dependency injection. I need to. Um, I remember a session during uh, the Zen conference in the US, I um, don't remember, a few years ago, four or five years ago perhaps, and I was invited to talk about dependency injection and the usefulness of dependency injection containers. And at that time, so many people were 
reluctant to the idea of using a container in, in the PHP world. And one of them was um, a Zen framework um, core developer. And he even said that Zen Framework will never have a dependency injection container. Well, just have a look at Zen Framework version 2. Um, is the one who actually implemented the container for Zen Framework version 2. So Symfony 2 was the first project to use a dependency injection container as a way to solve many problems. Um, flexibility of the code, of course, uh, configuration, and, and much more. And I think that Nowadays, nobody is going to argue with you about um, the fact that using a, a, a dependency injection is actually useful and the fact that using a container for a big project is actually the way to go. And Laravel is actually using a dependency injection container, uh, one that is based on, on Pimple. And, and Pimple, um, I created Pimple, which is a very small uh, container, um, just to evangelize the PHP world uh, and the PHP developers uh, back then. But it, it is actually quite useful. Okay, so um, some numbers about the Symfony uh, community. So we have about um, 850 contributors for uh, the core framework, uh, about 15 million uh, visits on, on symfony.com um, last year. It's about a million downloads every month for Symfony, the components, uh, Twig, Swift, Mailer, all the project I manage really. Um, and, and the full stack framework is uh, about a bit less than uh, 2,000 bundles um, written by the community. The last thing I want to say about Symfony is um, that Symfony is not a black box, right? It's just plain PHP code that you can read that everyone is able to understand. Um, but more important, Symfony is about implementing best practices, uh, design patterns, and, and, and standards. Um, it means that learning Symfony is more about learning about those best practices than learning something about the implementation details of uh, the Symfony code. And most of the concepts that you are going to learn about when reading about Symfony are not tied to Symfony. So it means that if you already know something about HTTP, the HTTP protocol, or dependency injection, you will be able to learn Symfony very quickly. And if not, the good news is that you will be able to um, use your knowledge in other technologies and uh, even in other languages. That's all for the first part. Uh, and this is my answer to what is Symfony. It's quite long. Uh, the other question I want to answer today is why Symfony is good for other PHP open source projects. Um, so first, you, you must know that when I started to think about uh, Symfony version 2, one of my goals was to make it useful for other PHP open source projects. So Symfony 1 was really useful for um, big corporation, companies wanting to create um, uh, projects. Uh, but I wanted Symfony 2 to be um, useful for other um, open source projects. So I'm really happy that it actually happened. And so for me, um, it is really useful to use Symfony as the low-level architecture of your project because of four different points. The first one is, it is a way to standardize the low-level architecture of what you are doing. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel again and again and again. Just use HTTP Foundation and be done with it. And of course, if you standardize your low-level ar architecture with Symfony, it means that you have more time to focus on what matters for your project. Um, so you just let Symfony do um, the boring stuff, really. Then it's about integration with other products. Of course, if many different projects are using the same Symfony components, like HTTP kernel, HTTP foundation, or uh, the console, for instance, then it is much easier to integrate all those projects, right? So it is much easier to integrate uh, a Laravel project with a Drupal one because they are using the same HTTP kernel interface, right? And of course, um, 
it is much easier to understand the code because they have the same foundation. I'm pretty sure that if you have a look at Drupal version 8, if you know Laravel pretty well, if you understand the Symfony code, then you're going to understand how Drupal version 8 works. I had a look at Drupal version 7, I don't understand how it works. It, it, it's, it's a totally different world, really. So it means that you have a larger pool of developers um, who can understand how your code work. And you are not alone, right? So Laravel is using some of the Symfony components and the same goes for many different uh, projects, big ones, um, smaller ones. We have CMSs, uh, RRMs, uh, e-commerce platforms, CRM systems, and, and, and even frameworks. So uh, a bunch of them, really. So Laravel is not using uh, the Symfony full stack framework. Um, it, it's just, just that's, that's great. It is using quite a few uh, components actually. So uh, I had a look uh, yesterday. So um, as of today, Laravel is using uh, quite a few tools uh, like the console, the process, the finder, debug, uh, the CSS selector. But the most important ones for me um, are the routing system, HTTP foundation, and HTTP kernel because those means that um, you are uh, interoperable with other projects using the same components. And now I want to talk about uh, HTTP kernel. So I talked about HTTP foundation and now I want to talk about HTTP kernel and why I think it is um, a very important uh, component for us. Um, I like to think of HTTP kernel as being the equivalent of FRAC in um, the Ruby world or WSGI in, in the Python world. Um, it's not exactly the same as, you know, by default PHP takes care of uh, the bridge with the web server, which is not the case uh, in the Python and, and the Ruby world. But still, it's all about standardizing the way uh, we use the HTTP protocol and the way we interact with it. So the Symfony HTTP kernel uh, provides the building blocks uh, to create um, flexible, extensible, and scalable HTTP uh, frameworks. And it leverages uh, the, the HTTP specification uh, to make the integration between uh, the projects really easy. So HTTP foundation is about the representation of the HTTP messages, the request and the response. Um, the HTTP kernel implements the dynamic part of the HTTP specification. So basically, as a web developer, your job is to convert a request to a response. Right? So you need to do something in the middle to convert this request to response. And HTTP kernel um, helps you um, do this um, handling of a request. We do that with a single interface. This is the most important interface of the whole Symfony uh, components. This is actually the most important file in Symfony. A very simple one. So um, we handle a request and you should return a response. That's all there is to it, really. And if you have a look at Laravel, uh, the class that implements this interface is called Illuminate Foundation Application. So in practice, basically this is how it works. First, you create your kernel. It can be any kernel. Um, the Laravel one, the Drupal one, the Symfony one, it should, it must implement the HTTP kernel interface. Then you create your request. Here I've created the, the request from the global variables. Then you enter the request, and this is your job to do something with it. You return a response, and then we send a response back to um, uh, the client. Right? And just because you are using this interface, it opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, and this one is one of the biggest problems in the PHP world. When you are using plain PHP for the HTTP request and, and, and response, um, the code is barely testable. It is just a nightmare to test the code. But thanks to the simple HTTP kernel interface, it becomes really easy to write functional tests. Here is a, a very simple example. So uh, by default, the HTTP kernel component comes with a client um, class, which simulates a, a browser. You give it a kernel. Again, it can be any kind of kernel implementing the HTTP kernel interface. And then you can issue requests. So I can request 
this um, hello Fabian uh, path and, and I'm, I want to use the get method and then you can get the response on the client and, and this is an assertion from PHP unit uh, just testing that the status code is 200 right pretty easy but we can go one step further because uh, the client actually re returns a crawler a crawler is um, like jQuery for PHP right and if you are using the CSS selector component then you can do um, stuff like you can filter the response and here I'm, I'm trying to check that there is a h1 tag that contains Fabian in, in, in the response, in the HTML response. Um, and then just uh, the assertion is just about counting that there is actually one such node. Right. Okay, so this is the first benefit of using um, uh, the HTTP kernel interface. Another one is uh, HTTP caching. Most frameworks and applications uh, out there have some kind of caching mechanisms, right? And most of the time, the caching layer is something that is done by the application. Um, and, and in Symfony, we don't have anything related to uh, caching because we are just using the HTTP protocol again. So if you want to um, do some, H so some response caches, you just set some HTTP headers if you are not familiar with um, how it works. So basically, in the HTTP specification, you have two different caching models, exploration and validation. And you can use both validation and, and, and exploration, which means that you can see, set a page to expire uh, every 10 seconds, and then you can validate that the, uh, the, the cache content is still fresh. Right? So it is quite flexible, and most of the time, uh, this is all you need uh, to scale an application. So the way it works, you are you just set headers on the response. So we have a bunch of uh, methods you can use to set some caching strategy in Symfony. So here we are just saying that we want the page to be uh, cacheable uh, for 10 seconds. Very simple example. Um, this one is how you can manage uh, the validation in Symfony. Uh, I won't talk about this one because uh, it's going to take too much time. Um, and then you just create a new HTTP cache instance, you pass your kernel, a store, and done. HTTP cache is actually a reverse proxy written in PHP. So it works in the exact same way as any other reverse proxy, right? It's great because if you can afford to um, install um, uh, Varnish, for instance, which is a reverse proxy written in C, then your application is going to scale even better. Right? And that's possible because we are implementing a standard, HTTP, which is very well known. Right? OK, so testability, caching, it's just two big advantage uh, when you are using uh, the HTTP kernel interface. Um, but choosing Symfony is not just about the code. It's also about the way we manage the project. Right? We have a clear roadmap so that you can easily plan your own releases. So there is one new release of Symfony every six months, and we have a new long-term support release every two years. So this is predictable. Right? A long-term support release um, comes with three years of maintenance and four years for security issues. So that's a lot. You, you can plan uh, the... the um, the upgrades to the new version um, very easily. And we try to work very hard to keep backward compatibility between all the major versions. So talking about security issues, um, we have a very well-defined process to manage those um, uh, security issues, uh, a very open process actually, and we use the CV systems to advertise uh, those um, security issues, and we also work closely with uh, open source projects using Symfony so that we can um, synchronize our uh, security related releases. So again, those are just um, basic examples of what we do to is uh, the work of our users, our developers and, and, and people using Symfony for um, open source projects. So to conclude, um, the Symfony project provides the low-level uh, building block that you need to build uh, a web product so that you can focus on what 
matters uh, the most for you. Thank you. So, <laughs> uh, do you have any plans of releasing the HTTP Foundation and the kernel as uh, PHP ex extensions anytime? Um, the thing is, it's not because it's written in C that it's going to be faster. Okay. Right. So, we did an experiment with Twig where um, there is one method that was ported to C because we knew that it was uh, a method that was called very often and we wanted to see if, we, uh, if it was possible to actually um, be faster in C. It is about 10 or anywhere between 10 and 20% faster, uh, the C version, uh, compared to the PHP version. Uh, we did some experiment on um, the event dispatcher um, and on some 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 other stuff, but uh, it's not worth it really. Okay. Uh, the the slowest part of Symfony, and it's not really related to Symfony, is actually auto loading uh, the classes. Okay. So you need to talk with Jordi about this one. <laughs> um, so, but there are probably parts of the framework that can be faster if they were in C. And, and we are looking into um, uh, um, writing a C extension for those parts, but we're not going to rewrite the full s framework in C. It, it just doesn't make sense. Okay, cool. Uh, hi, Fabian. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you for everything you've done for the past God knows how long for the PHP world. It's been it's been really good. Um, you said earlier that you hate PHP, uh, but you also kind of gave some credit for kind of where it's going. Or you know, for example, far you know, version 5.0, 5.3. Um, I'm curious what you think of where PHP is going. You know, whether you agree with things, for example, like the web server that came out just recently for PHP, uh, and where you think it might be going. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I still hate PHP. Uh, less than seven years ago, obviously, but still. Uh, because PHP is not really language, right? There is no specification. If you have a look at Python or Perl or Ruby, you, have, you can have different implementation of the same language, right? The problem, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if it is a problem, but uh, PHP, the implementation of PHP is also its specification. Right, which means that it's kind of impossible to have another implementation of the PHP language. There is no specification for the language. And that's probably not a problem. But it means that you can't truly really innovate. You can't you know, use the Java platform, for instance, or you can't do stuff like that. So we are stuck with uh, the C version of PHP. Um, I think the biggest problem with PHP is also its biggest advantage, the fact that for every single request, at the end of the request, everything is thrown away. So you need to start again and again and again, and you are doing the exact same thing for every single request. And that's a problem, for instance, for autoloading. It means that for every single request, you need to autoload the classes. And you need to do the exact same thing as you did for the, 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 the last request. So it, it's, I think we can probably speed up things a lot if we can um, find a way to um, keep some stuff from one request to the other one. And actually, I, I, I'm working on something. <laughs> Which is something. 
<laughs> it's, 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 I think, yeah, I, I can't talk about that because it's in early stages, um, but it's very promising. Um, also because PHP is really fast. If you, if you have a look at all uh, the benchmarks and, and the framework benchmarks in, in a lot of different languages, PHP is really the slowest one, right? the slowest language. But if you understand that PHP needs to do so much stuff again and again for every single request, if we can find a way to actually lower the number of stuff that needs to happen again and again, PHP is not that slow. It is quite fast. So hopefully uh, um, I will have something to talk about in the next six months or so. But I think that we can do something to speed up things a bit. And that's also possible because nowadays we have standards. We have PSR zero, we have, um, we are all doing the exact same, we are all coding PHP in the exact same way, which means that standardization means that we can rely on some things, um, which was not possible seven years ago because uh, people were doing PHP in a lot of different ways. Um, I totally forgot about your question. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I guess just you know, kind of um, w whether you're happy or not with the way ah, PHP is actually okay. going. So um, one one of the big problem with PHP is how do you deal with web sockets, right? And and a couple of years ago, um, it, it it was a very big problem for me because it doesn't make sense to use PHP for everything except for web sockets where you need to use. Node.js or whatever you want, uh, because you have two different languages and, and that's, that sucks, really. But um, some crazy people, um, like Igor, uh, did a wonderful work uh, with uh, how it's called? React. Uh, and it proves that you can do WebSockets with PHP. So there is some hope. <laughs> and 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 I th you know PHP is quite mature. Um, I think what's happening uh, nowadays about the function stuff, the fact that you can, you will be able, perhaps you will be able to autoload functions in PHP. Uh, the fact that you can use a function instead of having, you know, to use the full qualified uh, path for the function. Um, that's going in the right direction, I think. So we don't need to add, you know, nowadays I think I have everything I need in, in the PHP language. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting big changes in the language. Um, the secret thing you're working on to make things faster, will we be able to use that? <laughs> yes. Um, let me think about it. Yes. Yes, because you will be able to benefit from it because you are using the HTTP kernel interface. So basically, it's going to work for any projects using the HTTP kernel interface. So yes. Um, I just recently started following the PHP framework interop group. I see that um, most of the frameworks have taken part in that. How do you feel, what role do you think that will play in the future of, I mean, to sort of piggyback on his question, is it a good, uh, is it a good thing? Um, I'm not going to answer this question. Okay. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> um, I think it's great that so many different people coming from so many different projects are actually talking together, trying to um, unify the PHP world. Uh, that's great. Um, and the first few PSR are, are really great and, and they go in the right direction. Uh, I think that the cache uh, discussion that is happening uh, is also nice because if we can have, if we can rely on one cache system um, not HTTP caching, but 
general care system in the PHP world. And, and everything that we can do to actually make things interoperable are good for PHP. Um, well, and um, yeah, that's very good. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have time to dedicate, you know, I, I don't have uh, time to um, actually contribute uh, to the group. Uh, I don't even have time to actually read all the stuff happening on the mailing list because, you know, some people are very... Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Um, they talk a lot. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's fine. Uh, and, and also, because you know, it, it's all about uh, uh, bylaws and, and stuff like that, so it's, it's, it's kind of boring right now. But I think it's, it's kind of necessary to do that uh, so that we have uh, a clear process for uh, the future. Um, I'm not convinced, okay, I'm going to uh, tell you the, the, the true story. I'm not convinced that we will be able to actually um, have a single um, HTTP message um, abstraction, a single request and response uh, um, classes for PHP. And, and I, I don't think that we are going to have a single um, dependency injection container interface for everyone. That won't work. Um, I, I don't remember the other uh, topics, uh, but most of the topics that are discussed right now, except the caching uh, stuff, I think it, it's not it's not worth it. It won't work. And I, I wrote uh, uh, an email uh, to the mailing list a while uh, back about uh, why I think it's it's worthless and it won't work. Uh, we tried to unify the request and the response classes with Zen Framework version two. Uh, four or five years ago, it didn't work out. Even if we are talking about the same HTTP messages, there are, there are so many ways to actually uh, do the conversion uh, to um, PHP classes. So, and, 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 and you can't really define an interface for a request or a response because a request and a response, we are talking about data objects. So, and for data objects, it doesn't make sense to have interfaces, right? So it works well for uh, the logging stuff because you can define uh, an interface. It works well for the caching system because you can define an interface. It's not the case for the request and the response stuff. It doesn't work. And for the containers, uh, just have a look at the Symfony 2 container and Pimple. I wrote both of them and they share nothing. It's not possible to define a common interface for both Pimple and the Symfony container. So it won't work. I have a question about the uh, Symfony configuration. Uh, it's, uh, in Symfony, it's possible to set configuration using three formats, PHP, XML, and YAML. And uh, I ask this question to other Symfony developers, never get any response. Why this is happening? I mean, you, you said it started from scratch with Symfony 2. Why don't you just stick to PHP? <laughs> <laughs> so in Symfony 1, we had only one and a half formats. YAML and PHP. But it was really just about YAML. If you wanted to use PHP, you were not able to do everything, really. So it was really just about YAML. And so many people ask me for XML support for the enterprise. So, uh, so YAML is nice, XML is needed for enterprise people, and PHP is also uh, something that the PHP community likes. So in Symfony 2, by default, all the components can be configured with PHP, XML, and YAML. And then this is your choice, right? Having choice is, is, is good, right? And I think you are not using YAML in Laravel, right? Just plain PHP, it works, works fine, right? And the fact that we have three different ways to uh, configure Symfony means that we had to really think about how to abstract that at a high level. 
and and that's something that is done by mainly done by the dependency injection container. Uh, the configuration in Symfony is done by the container, um, and this we have this config component which uh, abstracts the way you actually uh, describe uh, a configuration. Which means that when you create a bundle in Symfony, for instance, uh, you declare your um, configuration with the config component, and then you can accept YAML, XML, and PHP without doing anything else. Right. So. Uh, as, as far as the developer is concerned, it's not really a problem because there is no overhead to su actually support uh, the three formats. Right. So, um, uh, yeah. If I were to create Symfony version 3, I'm not sure what I would do. Um, I would probably prefer the PHP version uh, but the nice thing about XML and YAML, and, and probably more XML than YAML, is that with XML you can generate stuff, you can modify stuff pretty easily. Uh, you have the completion in, in your ID because we have XSD and stuff like that. So I think it really depends on your workflow, and the skill of your team, uh, the tools you are using. Um, so if you are more comfortable with PHP, just use plain PHP. If you are more comfortable with XML, just use XML. We don't care. Um, I think it's probably kind of related. Um, I use Symfony 2 in work, and um, when I look at third-party bundles, I find that setting them up is often um, you register in the app kernel, and then you pull in the config, and then you pull in the routing involved. Um, is there any cause to make sort of like a single point of entry, like Laravel service providers? Or does that exist, and I've, I've not seen it in other bundles? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, actually, um, you can do everything in the configuration. Actually, if you just inject, if you add the bundle in your app kernel, mm -hmm. the bundle itself is able to do the registration of the configuration for you. It is able to register the routes for you. It is able to do yeah. everything for you. I, I tend not to see that though in the community, like um, in the you know the KNP bundles. Is that it's I, not I take my it, fault? They, yeah, yeah, obvi <laughs> obviously, yeah. Um, now, what I mean is, it yeah. is possible. Yeah. Now, why it's Would you not like done to see this that? way? It's up to the community, really. Yeah, cool. Thanks. One more? One more? Last one? Yeah. Here you go. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, you kind of emp emphasized that you did not take inspiration from Rails. <laughs> Why? Why not? Um, personal preference. I I don't know. Um, I think the um, the HTTP kernel thing uh, is mainly inspired by uh, Django, a Python framework, um, and I think that I'm not sure it's true anymore, um, but. Um, Five years ago, Rails was still um, a framework with uh, not with a, a very uh, hmm, um, the low-level architecture of, of Rails was not that great. So the the end user features are really great, and the API is really great. But the way it works behind the scene, the way it worked behind the scene five years ago, wow, not really great. Uh, and if you have a look at Django, this is quite the contrary. I mean, the API is nice, but the way it works behind the scene is really, really nice. Really easy to understand, just makes sense. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and so I started to have a look at, at Django. Um, I had a look at uh, Spring, which is a Java framework. And at some point, I realized that I, have, I had everything I needed so I didn't add any need for Rails stuff anymore.
Okay, thank you. Didn't realize you were talking about behind the scenes stuff. Okay, I think it was the last question. Okay, thank you.